All right, hello English uh, 580 classmates. I'm Caitlin O'Brien and this is my presentation for my paper. It focuses on gender and marital roles through World War II. This is a working title. I'm trying to find one that fits a little bit better. So just a quick overview of what I'm going to be going over. As many of you saw in my initial proposal, I had enough aspects and guiding texts and questions to basically write a whole dissertation um, regarding female sexuality and autonomy. So once I read Dr. Cornish's suggestion, uh, I just decided to roll with it. And once I got into To Bed With Grand Music, I knew that I made the right decision. I'm fascinated by sexual liberation and autonomy, um, as well as gender roles and marital roles specifically for women. So, yeah, let's continue. So through my research, I'm going to dive deeper into female sexuality and autonomy, as well as gender and marital roles. And To Bed With Grand Music really explores these ideas through a counter narrative. We saw a shift in gender and marital roles in World War I with an effort to go, quote unquote, back to normal life. And when Britain entered World War II, that shift had to happen again, and it happened more intensely. We'll get into that a little bit later. Um, so far, my research shows that there was difficulty going back to normal post-World War II, but it wasn't due to the war. It was more so something that had been building before that. I put all this together in the research question, to what extent does To Bed with Brand Grand Music reflect on the female sexual autonomy, gender, and marital role, role shift throughout World War II? So To Bed with Grand Music offers Deborah's experience as a counter narrative of the time. Deborah consistently acts out of typical gender and marital roles for this time. And that's even with her husband's approval to sleep with other men. It's kind of like an unwritten rule for the time. And Deborah, Deborah's narrative counteracts the idealistic ways in which women were expected to act. And this includes maintaining a home, working on the home front, childbearing, and so on. And in our discussion post, so many of us talked about how we supported Deborah in her sexual and work endeavors to some extent but we really had a hard time coping with her neglecting Timmy. So in my analysis, I'm really exploring the historical context. Um, so that way we all get more of an understanding of what the expectations really were of this time. Um, so that way we can also understand how To Bed With Grey Music is actually a counter narrative. And then I'm doing a really deep dive into Deborah and her actions and how that translates into everyday life. So in pre-war times, um, pre-World pre War II more so, Britain was still recovering from the surge of female employment during World War I, and there were also fears of women gaining too much autonomy sec sexually, socially, and economically. Um, and there were also a lot of concerns around women having multiple sexual partners and getting venereal diseases. During the war, these fears were really amplified and ramped up, especially as American soldiers started coming into Britain. Britain. Um, there was substantially more pressure for women to fulfill the roles of men within their households as well as still maintaining those feminine expectations, wearing makeup, raising the children, keeping the home. Now there, there's a lot of pressure to really go to work and support on the home front. And um, these responsibilities then actually remind me of the second and third unpaid shifts that we hear a lot in feminism today. And then following the war, um, there were these similar issues of women having a really hard time falling back into those traditional roles that they were supposed to keep. Um, and what I found really interesting in my research is that at this point, marriage therapy increased. There's a lot to dive into with Deborah, um, and it's really important to gain traction in answering my research question. 
And this process isn't com isn't completed yet. There's still I'm still in the process of tying everything together and weaving them together. Um, but whether Deborah intends to or not, throughout the novel, she is actively working against gender and marital roles. Um, and her mother and Mrs. Calmers like really embody this ideal femininity, ideal female gender role. And this is apparent when her mother points out that, quote, there are fundamentally two types of women in the world, the mother type and the wife type. And I don't think you are really the first sort. And this perpetuation of ideal femininity planted these seeds of doubts in Deborah that kind of pushed her to say, yeah, you're right. I'm actually really bored. And I'm, I mean, I'm hating my life right now. Um, so she goes and pursues work on the home front. Her sexual relationships increase to the point of no return, if you will. And by the end of the novel, she's putting her desires and pleasures first and really struggling again to fall back into that role that she was when her husband was still there, was there before the war. In regards to her motherhood, this thought has crossed my mind a couple times. So I, I can't help but wonder if her relationship to Timmy doesn't also act as a commentary of parenting roles. Um, it's, it's more socially acceptable for men to go away for the purpose of work or defending one's country. Um, and he can do whatever he pleases while he's away. And in this context, most likely having a lot of sexual encounters. Regardless of Deborah's intention, she does the same thing. She takes a job in London that's away from her child. And she also has those sexual endeavors. And, you know, many of us talked about this and we, we had the same issue of like, well, why is she doing that? That makes her a bad mother, but not placing that evaluation on, on her husband as well. This isn't a judgment on any of us by any means. It's more so a reflection of a double standard that exists. And then lastly, um, the last point I'm going to make here is um, Andrea Adolph points out in her piece, at least I get my dinners free, transgressive dining and Lasky's to bed with grand music. Deborah is, she points out that basically Deborah is barely an embodiment of feminism. And she's also referred to as a feminist killjoy because there's no true rhyme or reason for the things that she does, except for out of boredom and displeasure with her life. So I'm going to leave that there for now. I'm going to move on to the concluding statements and questions. So first off, I'm really looking forward to making these deep connections, um, but I'm worried that I'm still really broad in my research or that I'm not digging deep enough or that it's still kind of skewed and all over the place. And I would love to know what your thoughts are on that. I would love any feedback or ideas that you all have to offer. Um, and I look forward to seeing what you have to say. These are the works I consulted throughout my analysis, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your semester. Summer's almost here.